power. And I, in, my, in my heart, I agree with them. The church has lost the power. I do believe that in America. But the church in America has a lot more power than I've seen in Europe. I have seen power in America. So what I've then begun to realize is the church in America is also lacking truth. When we're in an era where everything can be redefined, like gender and sex, and then, and, and then even truth is redefinable, because we now have your truth, you know, live your truth, live my truth, and, and that nonsense is witchcraft, because what it does is it deletes the question to suit the answer. It, it, it says, I don't like the answer, so I'm going to delete the question just to match the answer. Truth doesn't change. It has no versions. There are no versions of truth. There are versions of experiences. And you, whilst you can tell me your experience, you cannot tell me your truth. The Bible says you shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. And so if you're sitting here today not free, it might be time to upgrade your truth. Ten claps. It's okay. Ten claps is good. Listen, I brought my own clap and my own amen to church today. I brought it all the way from London. I carry it in my back pocket. Amen. You can say, holy cow, I heard, if you don't like the, if you don't want to say amen. So let me ask you the question of this. The question is, and here we are today, as I'm teaching this, I'm, I'm online and I'm telling people, and by the way, I'm about to do an, an interview on Monday with Sid Roth. We'll share with you the details of when that is. Because it, he, he, called, he called me at the airport to, to ask me, what's the Lord saying? Tell me about this thing, Islam. And I, I said, Sid, everybody's trying to turn a prophetic experience into a political one. This is not, this is not political. Who fights over a strip of land no bigger than New Jersey? And you're calling it political. Oh, you know, I, oh boy. You know, I've had so many DMs that I've actually switched off my DMs now because people write to me saying, how dare you? I used to like you. Uh, now I don't like you. You've disappointed me. And my answer to them is, you never appointed me in the first place. I don't, I don't understand what just happened. Did you appoint me that you can be disappointed in me? I, I, did I miss something on the way here? Did you, did you call me? <laughs> oh God. Oh God. Oh God. And you know, then you have the intellectual bearded people, you know. The intellectual bearded people tell you Israel is the occupier. And these are Christians. Christians telling you Israel is the occupier. That means you don't believe the Bible. That's what it means. You don't actually believe that the land belonged to Israel through Abraham and through Moses who brought the children of Israel after a 430 year promise of slavery back to their land. You don't believe Scripture. Are you kidding me? I looked at the church. I said, "What?" I said, "What's going on?" Somebody wrote me, "Israel's the occupier." Israel's the occupier. I said, "I said, to the church, how many, how many Arab states are there? How many Arab states are there? Twenty-two Arab states. Twenty-two Arab states. How many Muslim states are there? Fifty-two. How many Jewish states are there? One. 22 Arab states. 52 Muslim states. And only one Jewish state. If Israel's the occupier, they're doing a terrible job. <laughs> terrible job. But you have these intellectuals who just come and they talk with their chests and they tell you a history that they don't understand because they don't believe in the scripture. Either we believe in the scripture or we don't. <sighs> then I was watching the news in London. I just turned it off. You know, I turned it off because everything is a parody today. It's not news anymore. 
I saw this uh, Queers for Palestine, and I said, I, I don't think you understand. Muslims are like the least tolerant. I'm, I'm not being funny, but though there was one protest in London where these, uh, these homosexual couples were standing, queers for Palestine, it was queers for Palestine, queers for Palestine, queers for Palestine, and then this, this, this Palestinian looked at them, <laughs> I'm not joking, looked at them, on the, on, on the thing, looked at them, and then they looked back, and he looked back, and then they said, and he said, and I was like, this is the world we live in where people don't know their enemy anymore. They're so busy following the wind, every wind of teaching, every wind of doctrine, that they don't know truth from lies anymore. They just know what they've been fed. We're like baby birds, mouths open, eyes closed. I'm telling you, we say amen to anything. One day I was preaching by mistake. I said, Noah and Noah gave birth to, man, to Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. I said, Wow. Wow. I said, this is the church. <laughs> because we don't read the Bible anymore, somebody can lead us astray. We've got to return to reading the scripture. We've got to return to understanding what the Bible says. Amen. Amen. Now look at your neighbor and say, we are a prophetic church. We are not a pathetic church. We believe in the word of God. We believe in the scripture. We believe that the Bible is the more sure word of prophecy. Is this ready? Is this full screen? Is that all you can fit in this narrow window? Can, can I just see it full screen? That's good. I prefer that to the, the stuff at the bottom. This is good. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Islamic question today. And just, just keep it there. Whatever slide I tell you, I'll tell you a slide number. You know, you know, Pastor Shane, you know the deal. Give me a thought. Okay, he knows the deal. Good, he knows the deal. I, just, just stay there. I want to talk about, uh, fundamentally, before we talk Palestine, Hamas, Hezbollah, how many watched the prophecy I gave on, on, on YouTube? Okay, so a few of you aren't going to heaven, the rest of you are. If you watch that prophecy, I spoke very clearly. The Lord showed me this is not Hamas, this is Iran hiding behind Hamas. 24 hours later, and I said, the news will begin to report this, that this will be uh, um, Iran hiding behind uh, the face of Hamas. And 24 hours later, the news cycle ran. Iran, 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 Iran behind this thing, Iran behind this thing. So the question you've got to ask yourself is fundamentally, fundamentally, is Islam a religion of peace or a religion of war? That's the question I want to answer today. But I also want to go a little bit deeper than that. And I want to explore something with you that will help you begin to see that this is not a political time. This is a prophetic time. And first of all, I'm going to take, draw your attention to the book of. I believe it's Romans. Let's go to Romans chapter 11. Romans 11. Let's go there. Praise God. How many are ready to be the army of the Lord? I don't believe it was a coincidence how we sang this song today. I keep seeing a vision of Jesus. Can't stop seeing it. Keep seeing a vision of Jesus on a white horse. And I saw him, when I gave this prophecy, I saw him standing with the angel Michael. And I saw him at the ready to declare war. And when Netanyahu declared war, I heard the Spirit of God say, now you declare war. And I said, what? 
he said, the reason I'm waiting is because I'm waiting for the church to agree with me that it's time for war. Now, let me say this. Many of you don't want war. You want peace. But what you're living in now is not peace. It's false peace. It's not real peace. The war that we're talking about, that the Lord is about to release, is a war for our loved ones. It's a war for truth to be reestablished. It's a war for righteousness to be reset back into a nation. And I, I you know, I, I, lo- I can't remember where it is in Isaiah, but it says something like, uh, God judged the children of Israel and by knocking down their walls and, 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 and turning their, fam- their land into arid land. And they said, you know what? We'll build stronger walls. He says, you know what? We'll build more fertile fields. That's America. God judges the land And the land says, you know what? We're going to use more fertilizer, bring in AI, and we're going to send. Do you hear what Bill Gates said? We're going to send something to blow up the sun or block out the sun into space. I'm like, look at these arrogant people. When are we going to humble ourselves? Bible says, if I send, if I call for a famine on the land, if I... Block, command the, the, the sky that there be no more rain. If I send locusts to devour your field, or I send a plague among you, if my people called by my name shall humble themselves, seek my face, pray, turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. In other words, these are the warning shots. The plague, the pestilence, the COVID, all of these things are just warning shots to get the church to a place where we surrender, God, we surrender. (laughs) Here's what we do, we say, let's build another vaccine and let's make this vaccine in 24 hours and test people. Instead of stopping what we're doing and saying, God, before we go too far, come and save America. You see, I know we're in the season of God's judgment. I'm not a gloom and doom prophet. Everybody knows me. I'm the most optimistic prophet you'll ever meet. In fact, when I was prophesying back in the day, people said, he's too nice. Now I'm saying judgment has come. They're saying, he's too mean. Because there's a day of the judgment of the Lord, and we are now in that season. God is judging America. (laughs) And if the end time picture plays out like it's supposed to play out, America will cease to become the hegemony of the earth. And that's a sad day. We're already seeing God judge the dollar. We're watching it happen in front of us. It's time for the church to wake up. He didn't say if the world will humble themselves. He said if my people. Can I tell you one of the greatest signs of humility is gathering together as the church again? Oh, it's getting quiet in here. Oh. I told you, I'm trying to get past my introduction. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll have to continue this. Um, Look at this, Hebrews 10.25, very quickly, Hebrews 10.25. Hebrews 10.25, and then I'll, I'll go, I'll rush through my message as quickly as I can. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Let us not neglect meeting together, as, as some have made a habit, but let us encourage one another as we see the evil day approaching. Hello. One of the express signs of your humility in these end times is that you stop having church at home as some have made their habit. As you see the evil day approaching, he says, it's time to come back to church. 
As we see these signs happening in the earth, it's time for the church to come back and assemble because there are things that cannot happen until the church assembles. Individually, we can only chase a thousand, but together we can chase more. This is why this prophetic sound needed to be released over Houston because the army needs to assemble for the battle to begin because God is not about to give orders to just anybody. He needs to give orders to an army. Can I tell you something? The sign that you are the army is that you hear the word of God like an order and not like a suggestion. There are some people in America who still treat the word of God like it's a suggestion and not like it's an order from their commander in chief saying prepare yourself to the battle it's an order some say it's an order We've got to begin to hear the order of the Lord calling and summoning us out of our bedroom and into the battlefield <coughs> in Romans chapter 11, the Bible says in verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not, but through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Look at this. It says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? No, they haven't stumbled that they should fall, but they've stumbled to provoke to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So salvation came to you and I. If you're non-Greek in this room, if you're non-Jewish, wave at me. You're non-Jewish? If you're, if you're Jewish, wave at me. Jewish, wave at me. Go. Jewish? <laughs> okay. We'll talk later. Those of you. <laughs> okay. He says, look. So he says that, they, that salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is richest for the world and their failure richest for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? God allowed the Jews to be blinded so that you and I could come into the faith. And he says, if their fall is riches to the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? When the Jews come back to the knowledge of the Messiah. How much more glorious will the fullness be when Jew and Gentile come together? This is what the scripture says. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but resurrection from the dead? Woo! Look what he's saying here. If they're falling away, did something for, for you to come in. He says, here's the thing. I, 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 the Lord allows them to fall away so that you and I could come into the faith. Not to replace them. Replacement theology is a doctrine of devils. You are not here to replace the Jews. Oh God, help me preach today. You are not a Jewish replacement. Stop listening to your Hebrew Israelites on YouTube. Get back to the Word of God. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good God. I've heard so much nonsense. Well, God doesn't care about the Jews anymore. And those aren't the real Jews. Have you seen what color their skin is? You know, Jesus was black. He was this. He was like, I don't care what color Jesus is. I just care what color his blood is. And as long as his blood is red, that's good enough for me. America has become a place that tolerates a cesspool of demonic doctrines, opinions of men, parcel to science. Get rid of it. He 
says, I'm magnified by ministry. Why? Because through you, I want to provoke the Jew to jealousy. But can I tell you something? We're not even provoking our kids to jealousy. <laughs> Some of you are going to wish I, I went back to the UK. Our kids look at us and go, what kind of God do you serve that allows you to struggle like you're struggling? Allows you to be broke like you're being broke? Allow, how are we going to provoke Jews to jealousy when we can't even provoke our own kids to jealousy? getting quiet in this Baptist church. That tells me something. Listen, I came like a bomber bull, all guns raised. I, I was in England too long. I was like, you gotta let me out of this. I gotta get back to the world. I didn't come with an English anointing. I came with a kingdom anointing. What good is it? How can we provoke the Jews to jealousy? David left the Ark of the Covenant in the house of the priest. And all of a sudden the priest's house was so blessed that David said, I'm going to bring this Ark back. How can we carry the living Ark called Jesus Christ inside of us? And no Jew is even saying, who is the God that you serve? It tells me something. Can I tell you what it tells me? We're not serving that Jewish king. We're serving that white king. Or that black king. Or that Greek king. Or, or that African American king. Or that British king. Or that European king. Somebody came to me one day and I said, they said to me, you know, I don't believe in tithing. I said, mm, I don't care what you believe. The moment you call him Lord, what you believe becomes irrelevant. Oh God, the moment you choose to stand on this altar and marry a husband, you have chosen that husband's policy and you have to submit to that husband's policy. Oh God, God help me today. Some of you come to Jesus like an American wife saying, I have my way. And he says, no you won't boo. This is my house. You'll do what I tell you. Oh God. I came to tell the American church God isn't interested in feminism and everyism. God is still a king. He's a man. He's a husband. He's got more testosterone than the rock Dwayne Johnson. Matter of fact, he is the rock. Can you smell what the rock... Oh, God help me. Okay. So he said... For if they're being cast away, is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? <laughs> For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild, oh, some say wild. Look at your neighbor and say, you are a wild olive tree. He says, you being a wild olive tree, somehow were grafted in among them. You see, Christianity is an engrafted branch into an existing faith. It is not its own faith separate from Judaism. Because Jesus came in John 4 to a Samaritan woman and said, you worship what you don't know because salvation belongs to the Jews. So if you're going to worship a Jewish God, you've got to understand Jewish customs. Yes, sir. 
Let me give you an example. In the West, your parents raise you this way. What do you want to be, son? What do you want to be? Hmm? A doctor. Whatever you want to be, just go and be it. I'll support you 100%. You want to be a music artist? Go do it. Want to be a rapper? Go rap. <laughs> want to go be a I will support you. I love you. And I will support you. In Jewish culture. Yeah. Fathers raise sons to carry on the father's business. Yeah. It is expected in a Jewish culture that especially the eldest son would carry on the business of the father. And part of that business, according to the book of Psalms, says, happy is he whose quiver is full of children. The Bible says he will not be ashamed at the gate because they will answer the enemy at the gate. Who? I believe that essentially the job of fathers in the Western culture is to fight the enemies of their sons. But in Jewish culture, it's the job of sons to fight the enemies of their father. I wish I had some church in here. And so, because we don't understand who we worship, whenever we're in warfare, we say, Daddy, protect me, help me. Sickness is coming, the devil is coming, black man is coming, and God says, you deal with it. I've anointed you to take care. Oh, oh. You see, in America, yeah, Father, please help, 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 help. But in Jewish culture, God looks at Moses and says, Why stand ye here weeping? Get up, boy, and do something about it. In Jewish culture, the sons take the battle from their fathers, which is why Westerners don't understand the scripture that says, for God so loved the world that he sent. I'm preaching better than you can help me right now. Say God so loved the world that he came himself. He said, God so loved the world that he sent his son. And his son said, For this reason was I made manifest that I might destroy my father's enemies. And this is what he said. I'm going to build my church. I'm not going to build it in the city. I'm going to build it at the gate. Because the children answer the enemy of their father at the gate. <laughs> America, while you're crying and you're weeping about the stuff God sent you to deal with, you let the enemy into the gate. Oh God. And now the Lord is asking you, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to push him back to the gate? Or are you going to let him push you further and further back off the cliff? Sit down. You're making me nervous. Because <laughs> there's the branches were broken off. He said that you might be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated, cultivated, it was already cultivated, olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree. 
So God is trying to remind us today that salvation belongs to the Jews. Some say salvation belongs to the Jews. If you believe the Bible, Israel are not the occupiers, they are the residents. If you believe it. If you don't believe the scripture, then Palestine are the occupants. What is Palestine? You see, everybody's running around, free Palestine, even though even I see some of you on Facebook. Free Palestine, I got you, I see you, I got your name, I got your name. I see you, I see you, I see you. The 12 babies had their heads cut off. Woman raped, pillaged, massacred, cut in pieces, dragged through the city streets. Christians are shouting, free Palestine. Because you don't know, it's coming here next. Oh, oh no, no, no. It's already here. It's just waiting for you to tick it off enough. Watch as the next debate becomes. We have got to let these refugees into America. Watch it. It's coming. Watch it. Maybe you won't even hear it. But it's coming. It's coming. Because we haven't understood God's biblical history of nations. Anytime a nation has turned away from God, the final and greatest judgment is God will send an enemy from the north. Against that nation. Anytime. It's the same. History has always repeated itself. Anytime a nation has got two inflated, too full of sin, iniquity, unrepentant atrocities, things that it has tolerated. God is obligated to judge that nation and leave behind a remnant. The boss says, a remnant shall return. There's always a remnant when God chops down the tree. He never fully cuts it down. I want to talk about this. Let's go to slide five. I want to talk about the biblical history of nations. The biblical history of nations. How many of you, 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 slide five, please. This is not slide five. Thank you. I want to talk about a biblical history of nations. I want to help you understand a God's eye view of nations. Because if you're not careful and you watch Left Behind, <laughs> you'll believe that God is coming through America. And the Antichrist is going to be an American or a Swede or a Roman. Is going to come from the European Union with a French guillotine to chop off everybody's heads. Who doesn't take Bill Gates' microchip. That is such an American view of scripture. God always tells the story of nations from the Eastern world, not the Western world. He always tells the story of nations from the Eastern world, not the Western world. So I want to talk about God's eye view of nations. I'm going to give you a little bit of eschatology, the study of end times. Can we do that? Yes. How many believe we're in the end times? <clears throat> so it's only right we understand. How many of you ever look out the window to see which chapter in the end times we're in right now? You're like, it's Revelation 6. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel has a Nebuchadnezzar has a dream in Daniel chapter 5 Daniel chapter 6 he explains it he tells people he's not going to explain it he wants somebody to come and tell him the dream and the interpretation wicked man he says I'll kill everybody if you don't tell me Daniel says give me a couple of days and let me pray about it and I'll tell you what your dream means and what the interpretation means 
And so a couple of days, God reveals the dream to him, and he shows him in the dream a head of gold. How I many you know the scripture? Head of gold, chest of silver, waist of bronze, legs of iron, and feet, clay and iron. Good, good. That means you've read your Bible, don't need to go back to it. Daniel 2.38 says, you, O Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. Good, you already know that. So that doesn't need interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar lived in Babylon. Babylon started in the book of Genesis. We see it at the beginning of the Bible. We see Babylon at the middle of the Bible. And we'll see Babylon at the end of the Bible. Babylon was the first kingdom established after the kingdom of God. Nimrod, the mighty hunter in defiance of the Lord, established a tower. Now, how many of you have seen the, the towers you watch in the movies and the towers literally reach to heaven? That's not what he was making. He was making a temple. It was called a bow bell with a gate. Bow means gateway. Bell means God. Gateway to the gods. Nim, Nimrod was setting up a temple where he becomes the center of worship. His wife, stroke sister, you can study biblical history to find this, Semiramis, becomes the, the queen of heaven. And they have a son called Tammuz, who becomes the sun. And they're worshipped as the sun and the moon and the stars. So anytime you see moon worship, sun worship, and star worship, you got to go back to Babylon. Revelation says, Babylon has become the mother of all harlots. The word harlots is the word idolatry. So Babylon is the mother of every false god on earth. Well, how, how does that happen? Some say, how come there's so many religions in the world? Because when God confused the languages, the mother remained the same. But the names in the different nations become different. Are you catching this? I just want a teaching moment. Are you okay? Yes. Names in the different nations become different. And so to some it's Siddhartha Gautama, to some it's Zeus, to some it's Apollos. But it's all Baal, Nimrod, and Tammuz. Same characters. The sun, the moon, and the stars. Same characters. That's why Joseph's dream, the moon and the stars and the sun were bowing down to me. These were symbolic of the, of the figures of Egypt that were worshipped. The gods of the moon that were meant to bring fertility to the land were now bowing down to Joseph. Ay, 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 ay. Are you ready for a teaching? You know, can we teach? We love preaching because it makes us like, but teaching, mm, it's going to ground you. So this was the case. King Nebuchadnezzar was Babylon personified. He was the head of gold. He was the symbol of Babylon. Babylon, by the way, is modern day Iraq. <clears throat> so Babylon is today Iraq. Babylon also means confusion. So there's a spiritual definition of Babylon. There's a literal geographic Babylon and a spiritual Babylon because it means to confuse. To confound. When Babylon is on the scene, people are living in confusion. You've heard me teach on this before, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on it. But Babylon is the mother of every idol upon the face of the planet Earth. After him, the Bible says, another kingdom shall arise. Let's go to slide 10. The kingdom of, the, of Media, or Media Persia. Which is why, are we in the same number? Number 10. Thank you. Which is why the kingdom of Medo-Persia was two arms on the statue. Medo-Persia was, was the silver kingdom. By the way, again, in the Middle East, Persia is modern-day Iran. Are you catching this? So God is not telling us, nowhere in the statue you're going to see Europe, nowhere in the statue you're going to see England, nowhere in the statue you're going to see America. In God's view of kingdoms, this is what he sees. And isn't it interesting that the kingdom of Persia, the prince of Persia, has arisen again? Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Now, isn't it just so powerful that when the 
Prince of Persia rose again, Daniel said, fast and pray. Come on now. He didn't turn this into a political thing. He said, it's time to pray. So Persia rose again, and many of you know about Cyrus, who was prophesied almost 100 years before by the prophet Isaiah in the book of Isaiah 45. And then Daniel finally meets him almost 100 years later. And it was under the Persian kingdom that the children of Israel were sent back to rebuild Jerusalem under that empire. And then you have the, the belly and thighs of brass, which represents the Grecian kingdom. The Grecian kingdom was a bronze kingdom. And if you don't know the story of Alexander the Great, you've got to check it out. Great story. But it's where you and I get our education system today. It's where we get the Senate from today. Without the Grecian kingdom, there'll be no Senate, there'll be no republic. That system of democracy was birthed by the Greeks. The Greeks birthed democracy. The Greeks were so intellectually powerful that when Jesus said, I will build my church, he pointed at a Greek building. Oh, that's another lesson for another day. I'm itching to tell that story because an ecclesia was a Greek building. So he pointed at a Greek building and says, I'm going to build that in our church, in our houses. That's another story. Then you come to the, 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 uh, the legs of iron very quickly. That's the Roman kingdom. We all know that Jesus was born in this kingdom, right? Right? Again, this was in the Middle East. This was not in Italy. It was in what is now called Istanbul, what was then called Constantinople. Constantine was a powerful Roman emperor. Powerful. The man took over the whole known world, set up his kingdom in what is now called Istanbul in Turkey, but called it Constantinople. Constantine's father made Christianity legal. Before Constantine's father, if you're a Christian, you were put in an amphitheater, naked, and lions would come out and maul you to pieces. And Christians, there, there are books written to date of Christians singing songs of worship whilst lions are tearing their bodies apart. The level of martyrdom there, it just entertained so many people that Christians were the fodder of lions and gladiators. But Constantine came and he ended all of that because he needed power for military conquest. His father made Christianity legal. He outlawed the, the killing of Christians. Constantine made Christianity universal. He birthed what is now known today as the Catholic Church. Catholic means universal. It means I want to universalize Christianity. It's important that you know your history. What do you mean? I want to, he wanted to universalize Christianity because he wanted the pagan support to go into war. And to get their support, he needed to, to find a way to appease Rome and make them all under the same banner. So he faked a Christian conversion. And then in his faking of the Christian conversion, he told all the pagans who worshipped Baal, all the pagans who worshipped Nimrod, all the pagans who worshipped Semiramis, all the pagans who worshipped Tammuz, he said, you no longer need to worship Nimrod. Nimrod is now God the Father. You don't need to worship Tammuz. Tammuz is now the Son of God. You don't need to worship the Queen of Heaven, Semiramis. Mary is now the Mother of God. And so today, in Catholicism, I was a Catholic, they still worship and pray to Mary because of Constantine. Constantine did that. He syncretized the faith 
of pagans who worship Baal with the faith of Christians. Constantine was the first one to move Christianity away from Judaism. Mm. Let's, let's look at it. Are you getting something? Yes. We've got we to start educating. Let me see if I can find it. <coughs> Constantine's here it is. This is Constantine's creed of salvation. I renounce all rites, legalisms, unleavened bread, and sacrifices of the lambs of the Hebrews, and all other feasts of the Hebrews. Sacrifices, prayers, aspersions, purification, sanctifications, propitations, and fasts, and new moons, and Sabbaths, and superstitions, and hymns, and chants, and observances, and synagogues, and the food and the drink of the Hebrews. In one word, I renounce everything Jewish legalism, custom, and right. And above all, he who is expected by all the Jews in the shape and dress of Christ, I renounce Antichrist and join myself to the true Christ in God. And I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the holy and consubstantial and individual trinity. I profess the dispensation where one day the Holy Trinity, the Word of God, took on flesh and became man. If I pretend to be a Christian and return to Jewish superstition, or shall be found eating with the Jews, or feasting with them, or secretly conversing, and condemning the Christian religion instead of openly confuting them and condemning their vain faith, then let the trembling of Gehazi cleave to me, as well as all the legal punishments to which I acknowledge myself liable. And may, may I be anathema that is a curse in the world to come, and may my soul be set down with Satan and the devils. This is his statement of faith. Wow. By the way... It was Martin Luther who took us away from Catholicism and founded Protestantism from which charismatic Pentecostalism is an offshoot. Yes, but the foundations are still there. Well, tell me, what do you mean the foundations are still there? Well, one of the things Constantine did was because he wanted the pagans to worship God, Jehovah, was he moved the day of worship to the day of the sun. Which is why we now worship on Sunday. Because Sunday became a pagan day. Some say holy cow. Holy cow. Sunday became a holy day for the pagans to worship the sun god. So he said, we don't need, you don't need to change anything. Just instead of worshiping Nimrod and Tammuz and Semiramis, just worship Jesus. And then they began to worship Semiramis. He said, don't worship Semiramis. Just pray to Mary. She's a deity now. We'll set up a statue. Jeremiah actually calls her the queen of heaven. <laughs> Let's read it. Jeremiah, take our Bibles to Jeremiah. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 18. The children gather wood, the fathers light the fire, and the woman knead dough and make cakes to offer to the queen of heaven. This was who, whose name through time was now changed to Mary. All in the name of Catholic Christianity. Universal Christianity was the goal. Well, another thing they did, Constantine did, was move the day of Jesus' birth to December. 
Somebody say, holy cow. Okay. Next thing they did was move the day of Jesus' worship to December because Tammuz died on December 23rd. And it was believed because Nimrod, his father, was a hunter. It was believed that Nimrod would be reborn in his son Tammuz. And his son Tammuz's birthday was December 25th. And what you would do on Tammuz's birthday was you would set up a tree. Some say, holy cow. This was Apostle Greg's idea. It wasn't my message. Blame him. He brought this up. They would set this up on December 25th. And this is why Leviticus chapter 19 verse 23 says, when you enter the land and plant any kind of tree, let me, let me, I'm, I'm in the wrong place. I'm in the wrong place. Let's go. Somebody finds it before me, just shout it out. Deuteronomy, that's it, 1621. Had all these notes this morning. You shall not plant for yourself any tree as a wooden image near the altar which you build for yourself to the Lord your God. I just want to listen. Somebody said, oh my God, I wish we didn't come to church today because Christmas is coming. And this, 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 this prophet from wherever just told us that our whole Christmas was pagan. Listen, I'm just here to tell Christians how far we've fallen. I'm not here to tell you, you know, if you want your tree up or tree down, that's not my business. That's not my business. But I'm going to ick you as to the tree. It was believed that in order for, um, the kids are gone, right? Okay. It was believed, it was believed that in order for um, Tammuz to rise again as his son Nimrod, he would have to get a tree, you'd have to go to the tree, you'd have to cut down a tree from the forest, and you'd have to put balls on it, and the balls were symbolic of testicles. Some say, holy cow. The tree was symbolic of a phallus. You don't know what a phallus is? Don't Google it. It's a, it's a pee-pee, a man's p a penis. The halo on the door symbolized Semiramis's Some say, holy cow. And it was believed that on December 25th, when the tree met the door, that Tammuz was reborn. And you would bake cakes with crosses on them and offer them up to the Queen of Heaven. Some say, holy cow, we're in the wrong place. What just happened here? Now, I'm just telling you how far we've fallen. People say, you know, people, people worrying about Halloween. Halloween? <laughs> <laughs> Halloween! It's the least of our problems. At least those people are dressed like witches. This one that we got a wizard who's meant to be wizard wearing red, coming down chimneys. I mean, I don't know. But anyway, I'm, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> Some say, holy cow. Holy cow. Oh, how much time you got? How much time? <laughs> okay. okay. Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. Look what it says. Hear the word which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord. Do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of the heaven, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are futile. For one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with an axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. <laughs> I hate to bring you bad news, 
But the Christmas tree was idolatry. It was. It was. Now, some, some of you are just sitting there. Like, uh, listen, I just want to tell you what Constantine did to us. This is what he did. Blame him. Now, listen, do I believe Christmas is commercial now? Yes. Do I believe that anybody who sets up their tree is not worshiping? I don't know. I just don't want somebody else's manhood in my living room. Come on now. It's just me. It's just me. Holy cow. One of the names in the Constantine Empire for Venus or Semiramis, one of her names was Ishtar. It was believed that during the festival of Ishtar, men, young men, would run around naked, sleeping with women like bunny rabbits. It was believed that Ishtar came down from heaven in a giant moon egg. Oh, Lord, help me. And blessed the people with fertility for that year. And this is why the bunny rabbit has become the symbol of Resurrection Sunday. I'm just telling you how far we've fallen. This is why the Playboy Bunny is a bunny. Because other than human beings, rabbits are the only animals that have sex for pleasure. Did you know that? Some say, holy cow. And so the bunny became the symbol of fertility. And all of us on Resurrection Sunday buy eggs. And we have no idea that it was actually pagan in origin. Oh, I'm not saying, what am I saying? Am I saying don't buy a giant egg for your kid? That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that's for me and my house. We, we, <laughs> we shall serve the Lord. Hallelujah. I, I, I'm not minding you. You can do what you do. It's up to you. And who knows? Maybe there's no power in it. I don't know. I'm just here to show you what Constantine did to us. Don't get me started on Valentine's Day. <laughs> I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to leave it alone. I've, I've done enough. I've done enough to you. I've done enough to you. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Let's Let's go there next time. Let's go there next time. No, no, because of time. I, I'm looking at the clock. There's so much, too much to say. This is, this was the entrapment of Constantine. That to date, all of us in the church, to date, in the charismatic movement, are still carrying on, unbeknownst to us, the same pagan practices that were handed down to us by Constantine. I don't know what it means. You know, people ask me, does that mean I should stop celebrating Christmas? I don't know. Honestly, do I think there's any more power in that tree? I don't. I think it's commercial now. I don't. I don't know. I just know I, I don't want it in my house. There's certain things you can't see the same way again. You know, my wife loves Christmas, so she, that's probably why she's not here today. <laughs> she, 
She's like, you're not going to ruin Christmas for me. Okay. Well, I'm just here to tell you what Constantine did. So after Constantine was taken over, Constantinople was invaded. Many people don't know this, but Constantinople was invaded by the Ottomanians. It was the Ottoman Empire that invaded Constantine, Constantinople. By the way, Constantinople became very hedonistic, very self-indulgent, very sinful, very, 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 very messed up. And then in their complacency, they were overtaken, because that's what happens. But they were overtaken by the Ottomans. The Ottomans are a Turkish empire, Muslim Turkish empire. The Ottomans are arguably the feet of clay and partly of iron. People have said, that's the Roman, it's going to be the revised Roman Empire. No, clay was the symbol of the Middle East. Clay was the symbol of the Middle East. But by the way, it's this final kingdom, the toes and the feet, partly of clay and partly of iron, that's the kingdom the Antichrist is going to come out of. So I say, holy cow. <laughs> Those toes are the kingdom that the enemy is going to come out of. He's going to come out of that final kingdom. This kingdom was Ottomanian. The Ottomanian kingdom destroyed the Roman kingdom. That's why it's partly clay, partly iron. They didn't get rid of everything. They renamed Constantinople. They renamed it Istanbul. Again, these countries were in the Middle East. So... It was this Islamic kingdom that did this. Daniel 2 verse 41. Let's go to slide 90, 90. Let's look at what it says there. Let's read it together. And as you saw, the feet and toes, part of pot of clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, for there shall be in it the strength of iron, just as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay. Iron mixed with miry clay. Now somebody go to... Pick up your Bible, your phone, and go to Bible.cc. I want you to see it for yourself. Or Bible Hub. Who uses a Hebrew app or a Greek app? Good. Click on that scripture, Daniel 2, verse 41. Because people have said, this mixture, I know what this mixture is. It's aliens. They're going to mix humans with aliens. <laughs> Somebody else said, I know what it is. They're gonna, Elon Musk is going to mix humans with AI. Let's look at what it says. Daniel 2 verse 41. Let's read it. So, if you've got 2 verse 41, if you go to mixed in the original Hebrew, who's got it? It's loading? Who's? What does it say? What does it say? Arab. 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 By the way, it's the same scripture that God, through Moses, God told Moses to separate Israel from the mixed multitude. He said, separate Israel from the Arabs. Are there Arabic Christians? Yes, there are. I know some of them. Great people. They're what I call remnant. But he says, separate Israel from the mixed multitude. Throughout history, the mixed multitude have always sought to do damage to the children of God. And so God says, separate them. Palestinians, Palestine was a name given by an angry king who took over, the, took over Jerusalem. When there was a revolt of the Jews against him, he destroyed them so badly, defeated them, and then humiliated them by changing the name from Jordan to Palestinians. Palestine was not a name that even existed. So when you say the Palestine deserves to be a nation too, there is no nation called Palestine. Palestine was a name given as a mockery to Jews who tried to betray the name Palestine is the name Philistine. So people don't know their history, they're just talking. Free Palestine, what is Palestine? Now 
And as you saw, the feet and toes, part of part of clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. There'll be a mixture. There's something about this final kingdom that's going to be kind of a weird Roman mixed Islam. Next slide. Next. Okay, look. Let's look at this. Let's read it together. This is Daniel 11, 36. And the king shall do according to his will. <laughs> he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper to the indignation be accomplished for that is determined shall be done neither shall he regard the god of his fathers look the antichrist is not anti-god I can think that the Antichrist is here because there's LGBTQ. The Antichrist is here because there's drugs. The Antichrist is here because there's prostitution and adultery on the rise. Oh, the Antichrist must be here because our kids are changing their gender. No, no, no. Antichrist is pro-God. Whoever denies the Son is Antichrist. It's not to deny God. Antichrist is not anti-God. Whoever this Antichrist is, is not going to regard the God of his fathers. <laughs> that means he was once a part of the God of his fathers and he left. <laughs> Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Three Judeo faiths. And only one of them have left the God of their fathers. Islam. <coughs> Are you catching this? Man, years ago, I was in my early 20s when I looked at my brother and said, I think the answer is going to be Muslim. I don't have proof for it, but it's in my spirit. When I started to study this stuff, I was like, ooh, okay. Look what it says, look. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of woman. Hello. Which faith disregards the desires of woman? Next slide. Are you getting something? I know this isn't the usual, but we've got to teach you now. We've got to teach the church. The Antichrist, go to slide 96, does not regard the rights of woman. Go to the next slide after this one. Let's read this one. This one's interesting. I have 257 slides, by the way. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of them. That's why I'm like, skip, skip. Look at this, Daniel 11, 38. But in his estate, he shall honor the God of forces. Whoever this Antichrist is, he's going to honor a God of war. In his estate, he'll honor a God of forces. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, with silver, with precious stones, and pleasant things. This is why the church of Jesus Christ is not prospering today. Because these guys know that their money is to build their God and his kingdom. Do you know how many Sharia courts there are in the United Kingdom? 257. Sharia courts. Did you hear what I just said? England is not a Sharia country. Yet, there are 257 Sharia courts in the United Kingdom. You don't think that, that the plans are any emotion? England doesn't even have, oh God help me say this right way. If you look at the Prime Minister of England right now, he's not English. Look at the Mayor of London right now, he's not English. You look at the First Minister of Ireland, they're not English. You look at the First Minister of Scotland, they're not English. All of them are of Asian or Arab descent. Do you know how many Muslims there are in France? 14 million. 
14 million. I'm telling you. I'm not saying that there aren't good Muslims. There are. I'm not enemy of Muslims here. I'm trying to tell you that America, we've, we've all but, we've just opened the gates. Come on in. I'm going to lose some of you by saying this. So when somebody comes who actually believes in walls, we say stuff like, no walls, walls are racist. Walls are the first thing Nehemiah built before he built Jerusalem. Because he's not stupid enough to think that I'm going to build a city without walls. Oh, it's getting quiet in this church. See, we politicize biblical things. We politicize abortion. We politicize walls. We politicize Israel and Hamas. Everything's political. It's not political. It's prophetic. Wake up. Don't let the enemy turn things that are prophetic into political things. Sin is sin, whether Senate passes it as a bill or not. And it's a state, he'll honor a God of forces, a God whom his fathers knew not. And he'll bless him with precious stones. You see, you've got to understand, the reason why Islam is growing is because it takes finances to advance a kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. Every, this is why you've got to honor the Arabs and the Jews. You see, Jews are a nation. Islam is a nation. Christians are the only one of the Judeo faith that still see ourselves like a religion. Did you hear? Holy cow. Somebody said, I said, Jews are a nation. Islam is a nation. Christians are the only ones who still see our faith like a religion and not like a nation. And yet God calls us a holy people, a chosen generation, kings and priests unto our God. You're not built for religion. You're built for rulership. All this happy, clappy, kumbaya, tambourine beating stuff, that's not where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be setting policy, making decrees, telling kings what should happen. We're supposed to be the shadow government on planet Earth. Kings are supposed to come to us and say, what can we do to be saved? When Jesus came to religious rulers and said, are you the son of God? He didn't open his mouth. Why? Because a Secretary of State cannot come and meet President Biden. A President must meet a President. A Secretary of State must meet a Secretary of State. A religious cleric must meet a religious cleric. A king must meet a king. So he opened not his mouth. Why? Breach of protocol. So when Harry came to him and said, are you the king of the Jews? He said, you say that I am. Can I tell you, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus didn't come to argue religion. He came to talk to kings. That's why he said, they'll hand you over to rulers. They'll persecute you in the synagogues, but they'll hand you over to the rulers as a witness. Oh my God. That's why whenever Paul was arrested, he said, take me to Caesar. I'm not speaking to you. I'm not here for religion. You religious people, you annoy me. I'm not here for your religion. Go do your debate. Take me to Caesar. I need to speak to him. Kingdom. 
a kingdom. Islam understands their kingdom. Oh, I wish you read Acts 19, where the Bible says, I think it was $9 million in one offering. $9 million in Acts 19. $9 million. And the Bible says, and the word of God prevailed. If you ever want to kill a vision, starve the provision. Stop sowing. Stop giving. Stop believing in giving. Meanwhile, the Muslims are giving. Because they believe more in Allah than we do in Abba. Some say, holy cow. They'll work Uber service. They'll work any service just to bring the proceeds to bless their God in your land. I think you're on the wrong slide. Your honor, God of war. Also, God of war. Slide 102. Let's go quickly. <coughs> God of war. A God of forces. Jihad. One of the ten tenets of Islam. Slide 105. This, this war we're in right now. Okay, that's how we're doing it. Got it. This war we're in right now is not a war of politics. <laughs> you see, you're, you're talking about Palestine does not want peace. Stop reading the junk news. Palestine, Hamas, Hezbollah, ISIS, whatever you want to call them, they want the total eradication of Israel. Off the map, the Jewish people must be destroyed. Very important that you understand that. If Israel stops fighting today, they'll be dead. Palestinians stop fighting today, there'll be peace. Palestinians do not want Israel to exist. When the nation of Israel was established by the Brits under the Rockefellers, the Palestinians and the Arabs rejected it. And they said Israel should not exist as a state. Period. They do not want Israel to exist. They want to wipe them off. Why? Because the Mahdi will not come until the Jews are subdued. Not possible. And by the way, this is only the beginning. The Jews are the front line of defense. You better be praying for them. Yeah. You better be praying. Because they're the front line of defense right now. If they fall, they're coming for America. They're coming for every Christian nation. Because according to Islam, the pigs must be destroyed. The pigs are not just the Jews. The pigs are the Christians as well. I don't think you're... Oh, we got to pray for everybody. we got to pray for both sides. Don't be a soul spirit. Don't be a sissy. The army needs to arise to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It's called scripture for a reason. Stick to the script. We've got to get all this political nonsense out of the church. Oh God, I've got to finish this. Let me finish this quickly. I'm going, to, I'm going to go all the way down. Let's go all the way down to slide 126. Wow. I want to teach you. Is this okay? Yes. The Antichrist is at the door. I'm telling you this. I feel it in my spirit. This tension that's going on in the Middle East is setting a stage for one mountain. The mountain of the Lord. Today, Arabs have gone to the gate of the mountain of the Lord and they've put a chain on it. I've been to Israel. They put a chain on it. How many have been there and seen it? They put a chain because they don't want Jesus to come through that gate as if a little chain. <laughs> True story. I'll never forget going to Jerusalem 
and I went to the, the mountain of the Lord, and I saw the gate, and I was like, oh, he's going to come through this gate? He said, yes, that's where Christians believe he's going to come through. And he says, the Arabs believe it too. See that chain on the door? That's to stop Jesus from coming in. I was like, wow. Son of man, say to the ruler of Tyre, this is what the Lord says. Next slide, please. Tyre is modern-day Lebanon. Lebanon, by the way, is in the news right now. Hezbollah. Hezbollah. So when he's like, prophesy against the king of Tyre, son of man, he's like, prophesy against Hezbollah. Not pray for them. Oh, just, Father, we pray for those terrorists right now. <laughs> Lord, would you just, Lord, would you just touch those terrorists in their hearts? It's like, No. That's not how God deals with terrorists. Can I tell you? He's Jehovah Jireh. But he's also Jehovah Sniper. He is. He, oh, he's not afraid to kill you. That's why I love America. They're like, we need to get rid of guns. I said, no, you don't. I'm coming here. I'm going to get my citizenship. And I'm going to get my little 12 gauge. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the Lord got a mighty rain. Oh, da, ba, ba, ba. Sing, ba, da, da, da. This is crazy. I don't believe in guns. Jesus said, the time has come for every man to take up his knife. Because people don't want to kill you. And you're not going to be praying whilst they got your kids at neck point. No, no. Somebody want to come into my house and take my kids. God bless you. May you come to the Lord quicker. In Jesus' name. We'll say the sinner's prayer whilst we shoot you. In the name of Jesus, receive it. God bless you on your way to heaven. Peace. Rest in peace. My God. telling you folks every man needs to take up his sword we're in that day the Bible says beat your plowshares into swords you know plowsh- domestic you gotta get you gotta get a little bit more warrior like because we're in a spiritual battle but a spiritual battle has physical faces getting quiet in this house, okay. I'm just saying. Oh, man. Micah 5, verse 5, slide 1, 2, 9. This man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land. And when he shall tread into our palaces, then shall we raise up against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. This is what my prayer is. My prayer is I believe we're coming into a time of the greatest division America has ever known. I believe it. I am no longer praying unify America. I am now saying unify the states in America that want to align with you. That's my goal. Because I believe, and this is where we get sheep nations from, I believe that there are sheep nations. I believe that depending on how you and I steward Houston, Houston can become a sheep state. Texas can become a sheep state depending on how we steward it. Because not every nation is going to join the Antichrist. That's the good news. There are sheep nations that are not going to align with the spirit of the Antichrist. Praise God. That's good news. Assyria is modern day Iraq, by the way. Let's go. Let's go quickly, quickly. 
to slide 136. Now, <clears throat> I want to tell you something. So fascinating, by the way. Christians are waiting for the return of Christ. Jews are waiting for the coming of Messiah. Muslims are waiting for the coming of Al-Mahdi. Christians are waiting for the coming of the return of Christ. Jews are waiting for the coming of the Messiah. Muslims are waiting for the return of the 12th Imam called the Al-Mahdi. <clears throat> this is what many Christians don't know. Christians are waiting for the return of Christ, the Messiah. Jews are waiting for their Messiah, who most Jews are, unless you're a Messianic Jew like Sid Roth and others, Jonathan Khan, who believes in Christ. Most, most of Jew Israel is a secular state. It's not even religious. And so there, many of them, the Orthodox Jews, are wailing at that wall because they believe that Jesus is going to come through that place. They're praying every day, Jesus, or their Messiah. They don't call him Jesus. <clears throat> in Israel right now, there are many who actually believe the Messiah has come. The Messiah who we call Jesus, they believe he's already come. The Muslims are waiting for the Al-Mahdi. The Al-Mahdi is their Messiah. He's their last Imam. And Muhammad's wa Muhammad was quoted as saying, his name will be my name and his father's name, my name, my father's name. In other words, he believes, Muhammad believed that the last imam that's going to come into the earth and do all these amazing things, their Messiah is going to be called Muhammad. That's what they believe. Next slide, please. <coughs> um Salama, his wife, Muhammad married a young girl. We're not going there today. When? So when the Mahdi appears, Allah will cause such power of vision and hearing to be manifested in believers that the Mahdi will call to the whole world from where he is with no postman involved, and they will hear and even see him. Next slide, please. And he had power, Revelation 13, verse 15, to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Next slide, please. Let's look at this. Abu Sayyid is quoted as saying, the messenger of Allah, he's one of us. Next slide, please. The messenger of Allah said, the Mahdi is of my lineage. Next slide, please. No, no, stay there. Go back. Look at this. So look at this. The Mahdi is of my lineage with a high forehead and a long, thin, curved nose. He will fill the earth with fairness and justice as it was filled with oppression and injustice and he will rule the world for seven years. Seven years. Hello. You, you got to read the Quran and the Bible like this. It'll change your worldview. This is where I began to think, what if our Antichrist is their Mahadi? Holy cow. Holy cow. Woo. Next slide. Let's look at it. 70 weeks are determined. Daniel 9, 24. That's seven years. Good. Next slide. Let's move on. Yep. Yep. Okay. Jesus is unique for being the only prophet in Islam who neither married nor had children. Yep. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Uh, this is it. Muslims believe. This is Muslims. This is what Muslims believe. That Jesus is going to return to the earth near the day of judgment to restore judgment and defeat the al masal Ad Jahal, sorry, that means the false Messiah. That means the one we're worshiping, they believe that Jesus is going to come to destroy the one we're worshiping. Catch this. Look at this. This is, this is Surah verse four, chapter 4 in the Quran. And I bet you never thought you'd come to church. And we, okay, okay, look at this. And they said, We have killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of God. This is what it says. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, though it was made to appear like that to them. Those that disagree about him are full of doubt, with no knowledge to follow, only supposition. They certainly did not kill him. On the contrary, God raised him unto himself. God is almighty and wise. So they believe we messed up because they believe that Jesus wasn't crucified for the sins of the world. They believe God took, Allah took Jesus to heaven and made it appear like he was crucified. Okay, next slide. Allah's apostle said, the hour will come, will not be established until the son of Mary, 
descends, that's Jesus, among you as a just ruler. Oh, this is powerful. He'll break the cross, kill the pigs, that's you and I and the Jews, abolish dizzy attacks, money will be in abundance so that nobody will accept it as charitable gifts. Mm. Let's look at the Bible. Next slide, look at this. And Daniel 8.25, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. Oh, peace destroying them. Who destroys people by peace? That sounds like politicians. <laughs> For peace shall destroy many, and he shall stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Just think about this. Now they're waiting for an Ahmadi who's going to bring seven years of peace on the earth. And Daniel 8.25 prophesies that somebody is coming who is going to declare peace upon the earth, but through peace... He's going to cause destruction. Next slide. Are you getting something? Yes. Let's look at Surah 5. They have certainly disbelieved who say that Allah is Christ, the son of Mary. Say then, who could prevent Allah at all if he had intended to destroy Christ, the son of Mary, or his mother, or everyone on earth? And to Allah belongs dominion, heavens, earth, whatever, whatever, whatever. Next slide. For there shall be false Christs and false messiahs who shall deceive the many and if possible deceive the elect. This is the signs of Matthew 24 of the coming of Christ, right? Next verse. Wherefore, look at this. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. He's telling us where this Antichrist is going to come from. He's not talking about Arizona. So behold, they'll say, if he's in the desert, don't go. Don't pack your bags. Because the Bible says these false messiahs, these false prophets are going to come and they're going to perform convincing signs. If it were possible, they'd deceive the very elect. I watched a Muslim imam cast out a devil in the name of Allah and the demon came out. Oh, yeah. Holy cow. Signs, signs that the Bible says is going to deceive many Christians. If he goes, if he says, I'm in the desert, he says, don't go. And if they say he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. Next slide, look at this. The, the word desert is Eremos. It means to the east or south of Palestine. What's east or south of Palestine? Let's look what's east or south of Palestine. Next slide. Next slide. Mecca. Mecca, south of Palestine in Saudi Arabia. This whole war, by the way, one reason, Israel and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia will be a gate for darkness and the gospel to, their, to the Muslim world. I'm telling you what I know. When that peace treaty was about to be signed between Saudi Arabia and Israel, that's when this war broke out. Because Saudi Arabia is the oil producer to the world. Largest. Look what surrounds it. Egypt, Palestine, Iraq, Iran, Lebanon. Surrounding Saudi Arabia saying, try it. Look what we'll do to you. That's why I'm telling Christians, pray for Saudi Arabia. We, Rig is in Saudi Arabia right now. Oh, we're seeding the ground for revival. I'm telling you, that outpouring is coming. Where the Muslim world will be saved. Oh boy, I gotta. We gotta go home. Let me let me get let me get you out of here. Slide 160. Iran's president, this is the old one, has suggested that Jesus would return to the world along with the emergence of the descendants of Islam's holy prophet, Imam Mahdi. It is well known that Ahmadinejad saw himself as the chosen one to bring forth the 12th Imam. 
to pave the glorious reappearance of the Imam Mahdi. The suggestion that Jesus and the 12th Imam would return to earth at the same time is something new and quite disturbing. So this is, is something that's not new, sorry, but quite disturbing. So Ahmadinejad believed that Jesus was going to return with the last Imam. Christians believe that the Antichrist is going to return with a false prophet. Are you catching something? And the only way to bring about this return is we've got to kill the Jews and the pigs. S slide 172, quickly. Let's go there. Slide 172. Look what it says here. Daniel 725. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and time and a dividing of time. Islam is going to come upon the nations and change times and laws. In many nations, they're going to turn some nations into Sharia nations. Next slide. Next slide, please. Let's, let's very quickly. How many believe the mark of the beast is a microchip? That's no, fine. No shame to your game. Let's cast out the lying spirit in Jesus' name. Go, go, go. How many believe the, is it, it's a microchip? Be honest, it's fine. You watch movies, I watch movies, we all do. What is, what is this? What is the mark of the beast? What is the mark of the beast? I, I, I want to just very quickly, if you don't mind, <coughs> go to slide 164 just quickly. No, slide 163. Before we get here, look what it says here. Fight the unbelievers around you. This is Quran 9123. Let them find harshness in you. Next slide. Quran 95. Fight and kill the disbelievers wherever you find them. Take them captive, harass them, lie in wait, and ambush them using every stratagem of war. Quran 495. This is why it doesn't matter if you're a conservative Muslim or not. This is why. Look what it says. Not equal are those believers who sit at home and receive no hurt. And those who strive and fight in the cause of Allah with their goods and their possessions, Allah has granted a grade higher to those who strive and fight with their goods than those who stay at home. And to all hath Allah promised good. But those who strive and fight, he is distinguished above those who sit at home by special reward. Next slide. Look what it says. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded. Which faith beheads Islam? Beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither image, neither had received a mark. Look, had not worshipped the beast, the image, or the mark. Beast, image, mark. Three things. We're all concerned about the mark. Nobody cares about the beast or the image. Next slide, very quickly. I will cast terror into the hearts. Quran 8, verse 12, of those who disbelieve. Therefore, strike off their heads and strike off their fingertips with them. If thou comest on them in war, deal with them so as to strike fear in those who are behind them, that happily they may remember. Quran 8, 57. The whole story of Islam is a story of death and terror. In case you never heard it, let me say it boldly here. Islam is a death cult. That's all it is. So Islam is for peace. No, it's a death cult. So it's a holy cow. Okay, let's go back to slide 176 very quickly. Slide 176. Look what it says. Quickly, and he causes both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand, on their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he have the mark or the name or the number of the beast. Mark, name, number. Three things. We're all about the mark. We, don't, we forget about the name and the number. Next slide. Here is wisdom. Let him that understand count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and the number is 666. It's not 666. That's a translation. 
That's the number. How many can see it? Can you see it? The cross swords. Bismillah. Which means in the name of Allah. And by the way, when you go to jihad, you wear this on your forehead. This is what he saw. It was Aramaic. The Bible was written in Aramaic, not English. So he looked and he goes, 666. No, that's what he saw. X, Aleph, S. Look at the next slide. If one looks at the X, Aleph, F symbol and turn it sideways, you see the Aramaic Bismillah, which means in the name of Allah. It's three U's. Next slide. Let's look at it. Let's look at it again. Next slide. There we go. Can you see it now? Bismillah. That's what he saw. The name of the beast. Bismillah. In the name of Allah. If that doesn't shock you, I don't know what will. Oh my Lord. When I saw that symbol, I was like, dear God. Slide 183. Keep going down. Just keep going. There you go. The first symbol is X. The crossing of the swords in Islam. They wear this during jihad. Next symbol is the Bismillah symbol. And the final symbol is the symbol of the serpent. Slide 191. Just going way down. See there, see where they're wearing it? On their foreheads. Now what about that no man might buy nor sell? Let's finish with this. This blew my mind. In Isaiah 14, the Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? That's Isaiah 14, verse 12. Lucifer is actually not his name. Lucifer is a translation of his name. Because all the angels have L in their name. They have God. Mike L. Gabriel L. Who is Lucifer? Lucifer is a translation. If you check the Hebrew, check it when you go home, Bible.cc. His name is Halel. Which Aramaic is Halal. It means crescent moon. I'm just, let me say, holy cow. Okay. If you look at slide 244, you'll see what's on most of your food products today. Hello. Whatever this spirit is, is going to own the food chain. And none of you are going to be able to buy or sell unless you got the mark, the name, or the number of the beast. Let's rise to our feet. Let's close here. There's so much more. But let's close. Praise God. Somebody ask you, is Islam a religion of peace or a religion of war? Well, the word Islam means submission. The, the Islam is called to submission. The church is called to dominion. Right now, Islam is doing a better job of submission than the church is doing of dominion. The Bible didn't say, attend till I come. It said, occupy till I come. So when we say we need an army, we need, what's it, synchronicity or synthesis or something? It was, that was a powerful song. We need, what's the word? Sequence. We need the body to be in sync with each other. Because
because every now and again, God will send a little warning shot, a little, just to say, church, it's coming. Church, it's coming. Church, wake up. Every nation that was great thought that their nation would last forever until it didn't. My question to you today is, what kind of America do you want to leave for your children? I know some of you are like Hezekiah. You're too old to care. You're like, at least this won't happen in my lifetime. All this crazy stuff, that's the millennials. That's Gen Z. I'm not going to deal with that. The responsibility will be on you in heaven. Because although our generation is living with it, you open the door. How did we open the door? I don't understand. When you raise your kids to be your friends, when you treated single parent upbringing like it was kosher and orthodox, I'm not saying we don't celebrate single mothers. I'm saying single motherhood is not the norm, nor should it ever be the norm. And I mean that. I celebrate the strength of those who have raised kids by themselves. I celebrate it. What a remarkable strength you've had to endure to, to, to have to be a mom and a dad and all of those things. But can I tell you something? It doesn't mean we celebrate society's normalization of it. You see, sometimes we have sympathy on stuff because we're living with it as an anecdote. So we try to turn the scripture into a place where it finds peace with our lifestyle. And that's not true. Listen, just because somebody is a single mother doesn't mean God loves single motherhood. Just because somebody in your family is struggling with sexual sin doesn't mean that God's okay with sexual sin. Sin is still sin, whether you sympathize with it or not. It still has to be dealt with. Listen, if your pastor gets a divorce, God still hates divorce. Even if your pastor did it or your teeth, God hasn't changed his mind just because your pastor did it. So we've got to return back to the army of the Lord. What does the army of the Lord do? Oh, the army of the Lord does so many things. I said this to the European church because I was really frustrated. I'm not going to lie. I was frustrated this past week. Because everybody says about Europe, oh, Europe is the place that doesn't give to leaders. You don't want to to ever be a pastor in Europe. You know, pastors in Europe work three jobs. They work a lot. Because pastor in Europe, their salary is like $500 a month. Average. Average. So pastors don't, there's no, there's no career for pastors in, in, in Europe. Unless you've really built well, it's very difficult. And so pastors tend to leave Europe, preachers tend to leave Europe because they, 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 the expectation of the people is unrealistic. How can I feed you whilst I'm starving, wondering how I'm going to feed my kids? And they're just looking and saying, God will bless you. God will bless you. And that's why Christianity is dying. Because faith without works is dead. That's why it's my goal. It's my goal to, my goal in life is to bless my leaders. Both those whom I serve and those who serve me in the ministry of the Lord as co-laborers. My life is to make sure, I want to make sure everybody's financially okay. So their goal is to just preach the gospel. I had the privilege of hearing Dr. Sharon. She came to me, she goes, goes, son, I just want to thank you. Over the week, she said, thank you for the seed you sowed. I didn't even know we sowed a seed. My team, they do things on automatic now. So I'm like, thank you. Oh, I just want to thank you so much for your seed. I was like, oh yeah, yes, you're, you're welcome. I showed it to me. She goes, oh, tell me. She goes, we can buy a house. That's my dream. That ministers of the gospel. I told God, as long as Dr. Sharon is alive, my goal is to make sure she's okay. The woman's almost 70. Preached the gospel for 40 years. 40 years. Preaching the gospel. Never took a pension. 
Never had a retirement plan. I told God, I'm going to be her retirement plan. I said to the Lord, if you're blessed, Tamar and I, we're just going to take care of her. And I thank God he's proved his word. We made that vow 10 years ago. I thank the Lord 10 years later. She just looks at me and says, we can buy a house now. Because we give and we give and we give and we give. We understand it. We give to the house. We give to her. We give to the work of the Lord that's happening. It's my goal here too. My goal is to make sure that Greg and Sharon don't even think about ever working another day in their life. Ever. It's my goal. It's my goal. So I'm thinking every day, I'm calculating, how can we do this now? I've even cut down all my trips this year. I'm not going anywhere anymore, except for the next two weeks. <laughs> I couldn't cancel those ones, but I canceled a couple. I said, I'm sorry, I can't come. I'm sorry, I can't come. Because the Lord showed me the dream, me just canceling trips. So I called people. I said, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to be in Houston. As much as I can. As much as I can. I'm going to be in Houston. As long as it's not a rig thing. I'm going to be in Houston. Because we've got to build this house. And to build a house, the leaders have to be okay. You can't start the ox as plowing and expect the house to be built. It's not going to happen. You've got to take care. You've got to priorities. Feed the oxen first, then feed the house. Starving oxen don't build good houses. <laughs> oh, America. I've watched so many of America's leaders fall and people in the congregation. I knew they were going to fall. Did you feed them? Did you worry about their kids? I said, I'm so grateful for this house. I said, I was just like, thank you for taking care of my children whilst we were gone. Honestly. I saw pictures, people taking them to the school, people taking them to the park. We didn't even have to worry. You don't know how much of a luxury that is. When I hear preachers tell stories in my congregation, they just... I guarantee you, any church that honors its leaders is going to do well. Any church that prioritizes other things above the leaders, if the shepherd is struck, the sheep will scatter. So your first priority is how do we take care of our leaders? How do we take care of our shepherds? How do we make sure they're okay? And then the second priority has got to be of the army. Let's build the house. I'm reminded of the story of David when he's coming back from Ziglag to Ziglag and he sees his wife and the children. Everybody's been kidnapped. And he starts crying. Imagine me crying now as, as, as Greg is here and Sharon's been taken, Tamar's been taken, Misty's been taken, and David and Greg are just looking at me. And I don't know what to do. The Bible says, they said, Let's kill the fool. They wanted to murder him. How's our leader crying when we need solutions? And so the Bible says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Come on, David. Get up. You're a king. You're a mighty warrior. You're a man after God's heart. As he's encouraging himself, he said, God, should I go? That's why I always tell people. The first thing, before God speaks to you, the first thing he's got to deliver you from is the spirit of depression because you can't hear God in depression. That's why I love the testimony of our sister who got delivered from depression because it's the first thing. It's the first thing God did before he spoke to me. He had to break free from heaviness because you can't carry a heavy spirit and a holy spirit at the same time. And I'll tell you why, in case you don't know, it's because the Holy Spirit is heavy. His yoke is light, but it's a yoke. You can't carry two yokes. You can't carry the burden of the world and the burden of the Lord at the same time. You've got to choose to unburden yourself, casting it onto Jesus to take on his yoke, his burden. Anyway, he went, they defeated them, brought back wives, all the wives, all the children. And then there were some who were too tired to go to the war. So they said, we'll stay with the supplies. Right? When they came back, 
they said, these men started to, these men that stayed with the supplies started to go, oh, let's, let's get some of the rewards for us and our children as well. And some vain men said, these men are not going to touch a single thing. How can they touch something when they didn't go to war with us? And David said, stop it. The one who goes to war and the one who stays with the supplies will both share in the same reward. Can I tell you in Rig, there are two, two categories of people I want to see raised up in Rig. Radical preachers and radical givers. I'm going to tell you, radical preachers. That's why I love street church. Oh my goodness, God bless street church. God bless street church. Radical preachers, radical givers. If you never preach the gospel a day in your life, because maybe you're an introvert, maybe you're shy, maybe you're nervous around people, then at least stay with the supplies. At least, if you don't open your mouth to tell somebody about the gospel of Jesus Christ, at least don't starve the people that do. Become a supply chain for the gospel. Do you know why? Because when you get to heaven, God's going to say, thank you for saving that soul. He said, I never saved them. He said, but you sowed the seed that started the crusade, that led that person to Jesus. You and them will share in the same reward. I want to raise people who are so dangerous. You understand what I mean by dangerous givers? Hey, listen, if you're a radical preacher, wave at me. Radical preachers? I love radical preachers. If you're a radical giver, wave at me. I love radical givers. If you're both, wave both hands. Unless you're carrying a baby. <laughs> I'm believing God. <laughs> you know, we all dance and celebrate it when we hope we got alone. My faith is a bit deeper than alone. I said, my faith is a bit deeper than alone. My faith says, what if God wants us to be debt free? That's my faith. What if God wants us to be so debt free that there are people who say, okay, we're going to be in the war with David. And the people say, okay, we're going to stay with the supply chain. We're going to make sure that our income, can I, can I tell you what makes the army of Islam so strong in the earth? I'll say this final thing is every job they have at the front of their mind is how do we finance the movement? The church at the front of our mind, every finance we have. How do I pay my bills? How do I fix my life? How do I pay for that special holiday I've always wanted to go on to Fiji? Because we don't yet see ourselves as a nation. We're still acting like a religion. If you ever want to ruin a nation, two things the Bible says. R get rid of the people. The lack of the people is the ruin of a prince. Get rid of the money. If you get rid of finances, the kingdom cannot stay strong. So I want to encourage you today. Let's get the offering tray out. But I want to do something today. You know, some of you are just like, you know, I, you know, I gave, I give. By the grace of God, I have the privilege of saying, you know, my wife and I, we pledged $100,000. I have the privilege of saying that this week, this week, we're going to pay off the whole thing. I'm telling you. I'm so excited. Oh, when the rest of the money came in, I said, Woo, she, thank you, Lord. We can pay this thing. Have we paid it yet? Not yet. We'll pay it. Don't worry. They do things without me looking. So they'll pay it. I know they will. They're just so consistent and so faithful. But this week, I have the privilege of saying, we're going to pay the whole thing off. And that's not where we're stopping. I'm like, God, what's the next pledge? Is it a million dollars that you want me to sow? Because if God's going to ask me to sow a million dollars... It must mean he's, gonna pl he's got a plan to bless me with at least $5 million. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, because I am both a prophet and a supply chain. I've decided to be both. And so God always gives seed to the sower. So I want to challenge some radical people. I want to challenge some radical people. 
You know, I think it was the founder of Colgate that said, God, I'll give you 60% of my income and I'll live on the rest if you'll bless me. And God did it. Jacob said, God, I'll give you 10% if you'll bless me. And God did it. Oh, he's arguing with tithe. Oh, man, I don't believe in tithe. Tithe is the smallest part. You want to be the army. You've got to hear the command of God to give, not the suggestion. Oh, because... I'm telling you, I look at that school across the street and I said, we're going to own that school. And God said, I love that you're professing, but until you teach people how to give and sow, you'll never possess the gates. Oh, yes. We've got to teach faithful giving, sacrificial giving. We criticize Ananias and Sapphira, but none of us have ever sold our houses to put it in the offering tray. Never. Those silly people thought they could lie to the Holy Spirit. You've never sold a house and put the money for the house in the offering tray. Until you can do that, don't judge them. It's not easy being Ananias and Sapphira. It's very easy to put $50 in the offering tray. Very easy. Some people it's not easy. Very easy to put $20. Some people it's not easy. Very easy to put $10. Some people it's not easy at all. But I tell you when it becomes easy, when you've done it every week. When it's easy, it's time to upgrade. Hello? Is this microphone working? When it's easy, it's time to upgrade. Oh, I've given $10. Next time, $10. Next $10. But when you want to grow in financial stewardship, you start going, okay, God, I, it's gotten easy for me to give at this level because, because you, you give at the level you live. So if you want to upgrade your living, you've got to upgrade your giving. Okay, God. So I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to step a little. I give him $10 every Sunday. This, I'm going to consistently give $50 every Sunday. Every Sunday without fail. Boom. Next Sunday, oh, it's really hard to get it. But boom. Next Sunday, ugh. But I'm going to prepare it before Sunday. I'm going to put it in a special envelope. I'm going to pray over it every day till Sunday. That's how you do this, by the way. Oh, God, I'm so comfortable giving $100. I'm going to give $200. God, I'm so comfortable giving $200. i am going to give $500. That's how it grows. It grows. You don't break free of poverty by having a higher paying job. You break free of poverty by having a higher level of giving. I'm telling you. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, shut up. I can't believe it. Oh, super. And the kids will show up. Oh, praise God. <coughs> this man over here. Yes, with the glasses. Yes. Something so unique about you. There's a call of God on your life. I'm just admiring the angelic presence around you. It's a call of God on your life. And it's big. I just hear the Lord say, tell him thank you. I'm looking at him saying, why thank you? And the Lord calls you faithful. The Lord calls you tried. The Lord calls you true. And the Spirit of God says, I'm releasing upon you in this season an overflow of revelation and an overflow of desire for the real thing. There is something that you've just left and said, I'm done with this. I I can't touch this. I can't do this anymore. And the Spirit of God says... You didn't just leave it. The Lord said, you heard my call to a higher place. And so the Lord says, because of this, the Lord says, I'm going to bless you with double what you left. (laughs) 
And the Lord says, I've always trusted you like, like, a, like a little bit of a seer. Like you see when the seasons are changing. You discern when the winds and the tides are changing. And you know when it's time to come into a higher level. You know when the ravens have stopped feeding. You know when it's time to shift and move and pivot. And so the Spirit of God says, there is a new divine pivot that I have released upon you. And the Lord says, it's going to cause you to be a man that comes into the company of great men. And the Spirit of God says, I'm going to bless you because the Lord says, you desire to be a servant for me and a steward of my kingdom and the Lord says you gave when there was nothing left to give the Lord says you sowed when there was nothing left to sow the Spirit of God says you've been a man who I've caused to increase your expectation to a new level because the Lord says I promised you years ago that you were going to be a blessing to my kingdom in a great way and so the Lord says I now call your hands favor and prosperity And the Spirit of God says, because you obeyed me, and it's almost like when I told Abraham, get out of your father's house and get away from your country and go to a place that I will show you. And the Lord said, there I will bless you. The Spirit of God says, you've always moved to the next place of instruction and not necessarily the next place of benefit for yourself. And so the Lord says, because of this, the Spirit of God says, I open up a door to you in this season. And the Spirit of God calls it the double doors. And the Lord says, much like I changed Simon's name to Peter, and I said he will be the rock on which I will build my church. The Lord says, I'm giving you a name, says the Spirit of God, that the Lord says none of your enemies will be able to withstand or refute. And the Lord declares over you that the courts of heaven are now open and the books are now open. And the Lord says, with my books, the Lord says, I'm opening them because there are things of justice that I still need to bring forth on behalf of you and your family. And the Spirit of God says, I am not a God that looks at injustice with an uneven eye. The Lord says, I am settling the cases. And the Lord says, I am drawing to a close, an old season. And the Lord says, I'm calling you a generational blessing. What your father never walked in, you will walk in. <laughs> father, we release apostolic might upon this man right now. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, there it is. Just catch it right now. Oh, I see it. In the name of Jesus. Come on, just clap for the Lord. God is so good. God is so good. Wow. Praise God. I guess it was his day for a word. Tell me your name, sir. His name is Kent. Sir? Gary. Is it Gary or Kent? <laughs> Sir? Kent. <laughs> Bless Kent in the name of Jesus. Amen. God is so good. Now listen, precious people, let's sow faithfully. Let's commit to the Lord with our giving. Let's support the work of his kingdom. Let's, <clears throat> let's do something remarkable. Let's take sunny side for Jesus. Let's take sun and for Jesus. Can we do that? Yeah. I believe if God can trust us to take sunny side, 
they'll trust us to take Houston. I believe it. <laughs> so may the Lord find us faithful and bless your giving. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give. Please bring your, your seat. If you're giving by phone, please um, tap the altar with your phone as is our custom. God bless you. dedicate your life back to Jesus or maybe you have not received Christ but you need him today we're inviting you to come up to the front and we're going to pray we have a team of people who will pray with you and so I'm just uh, asking everyone here today if that's you we're just going to ask you to come right on up come right on up and we'll pray for you Anybody else, you need to give your heart to the Lord. You need to give your heart to Jesus. Come on, come on. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Anybody else? Okay. Um, we have some, some other announcements. Okay, we're going to be taking care of these who came to the front. Anybody else? Just come meet us right here. My, my, my. Every angel is rejoicing and shouting and celebrating with those who have come to the, to the Lord. Come on, give them a shout one more time. Hallelujah. We rejoice for a new beginning, a new life. Amen. Well, we'll have a couple of closing announcements as we wrap up. If you may take your seats really briefly. All parents, we're asking that you would please make sure that you pick up your beautiful little children right directly after service here today. And please make sure that when you go that you have your pickup card so that you can receive them as quickly as possible. Also, many of you probably know all of these wonderful testimonies that you are hearing each and every week here at RIG. Well, guess what? You have the opportunity as well to share your testimony right here to my left or to your right, directly in the rear of the building. We have a testimony booth. So we're asking that you would please go back there and share your testimony so that we can rejoice with you, celebrate with you, and share these testimonies with each and every one. And lastly, if you would like to be baptized, this is something that we do here each and every week at RIG. We do not do this in a religious habit, but this is a true transformational time. And so we're asking that if you would like to be baptized, as this is something that's been tugging on your heart and you have a desire to do so, then we're asking you to please go right through these exit doors once we end service and to your left and someone will greet you there and they will give you all the information and prepare you for that time. It's going to be absolutely powerful. All right. Well, we've had our call to those who would like to receive Christ or have recently received Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives. There are three others that we'd like to connect directly after service. If, uh, 
those, if you have just recently moved to Houston, we want to know who you are. We want to help you, support you, and help you get solidified here in the city, here at Rick, and also here at Rick Global. Secondly, if those who are uh, have received Christ as Lord and Savior, but you've moved here and you're, or you're part of Rick Global, and you would like, well, I'm sorry, if, if you are here and you would like to be a part of Rick Global, join the body of Christ and serve in this local body, we want to connect with you. And also those who have connected and that you're a part of Rick Global, but you're not serving in the body and you want to support the family, uh, the the global impact that we're having from this local base, please, all of those who I just mentioned, please come directly after the closing of service. If we could ask everyone to please stand. What a powerful word. A powerful, powerful word. I Come on, give God some praise for the word that he's delivered through the man of God today. What a powerful, powerful word. I think he was living in the bowels of revelation to get the teaching that he delivered to you. We eat good here. Amen. Before we leave, I feel like it's appropriate, especially the word that was just delivered, that we pray for Israel. Amen. Would you join me in that? If it would believe me, let's, let's, let's actually turn to the east. The east is that direction. Everybody turn towards the exit signs. That's the direction of the east. Let's pray and direct our prayers towards Jerusalem. I want to read a scripture here that many of you will be familiar with. Psalms 122. It says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Let peace be within your walls and prosperity be within your palaces. Psalms 137 says, If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt, O Jerusalem. Stretch your hands towards the east, both hands, and let's pray. Father, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray that you will strengthen the leaders. We pray over uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. We pray over the cabinet members, the leaders of the Knesset. We pray that you will give them strategic warfare, strategic insight and clarity and understanding of how to defend your covenant people, the apple of your eye. Strengthen the nation that represents your kingdom, stripping the nation that is in covenant with you. Yes. I pray America will never cease its connection with Israel, that we will always stand with Israel, and that we will stand with the covenant people that represent your word. We bless this nation, protect them from all nations of the world that come against them. May they stand and may they represent your kingdom for the end until the end of times in Jesus name and everybody said amen, amen. give the Lord Almighty praise and now we'll let you leave father we thank you may you bless your people bless them keep them make your face shine upon them keep them safe as they go about expanding your kingdom in Jesus name amen have an amazing week we'll see you next week remember our chili kickoff is next Sunday don't forget to get your rig gear on the way out today. We look forward to seeing you all. Have a blessed, amazing, and prophetic week in Jesus' name. Amen.